Today we're going to talk about family, and so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 9 through 12, and when I, we, we've been in this book, a sermon series, Building a Family of faith, uh, and we've not necessarily been talking about just our own family while everyone here comes from family, uh, but we've been talking about the greater sense of the word family in the New Testament, talking about the brothers and sisters who are in Christ, that we are followers of God, and by being a follower of God, that has placed us in a very specific spiritual family, and we know that specifically here at Brookwood Baptist Church, we ha may have guests and visitors who are visiting from out of town or uh, uh, another church, maybe you haven't had uh, services yet or something like that, but but when we are part of a family, uh, it comes with certain expectations, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but, but you may come from, like my family, my family, uh, I have three younger brothers, a, a half-brother and two step-brothers, and we talk to each other every couple of weeks. Uh, we see each other at holidays. We, I mean, I love them. They love me, but we are not in each other's lives every single day, and so, um, you know, you may be my, I know in Jacksonville, we have a lot of transient stuff, and so you may not be from Jacksonville. I think we may have 15 people here that are from from Jacksonville themselves, but but your family's kind of all spread out all over the place, and so when we think about family, you may be thinking back to your biological family, not realizing that God has given you a, and grace has given you a great family maybe, but he has called you into a special family. And John, uh, Joe Hellman talks about this in his book, When the Church Was Family. He said, while marriage was important for those reasons, the closest same generation family relationship was not the one between husband and wife. It was the bond between siblings. No image for the church occur, occurs more often in the New Testament than the metaphor of family, and no image offers as much promise as family for recapturing the relational integrity of first century Christians for our churches today. What he's saying there is that when we think about the church, don't think about the church in terms of we're all individuals a part of this group. What in reality has happened is we have become brothers and sisters in a greater family. And with that carries such a, uh, an expectation and a responsibility to each other that we love each other, that we work hard for each other, that we care for each other, that we bear uh, each other's burdens, that we are quick to forgive. All those ideas that we have are grounded in the sense of the family. And so even if you didn't come from a family that has many or any brothers or sisters, or you didn't come from a family that is a fond memory of your brothers and sisters, that doesn't change that you are in a family of brothers and sisters. And this family is what we make it. This family is what we make it. We have that responsibility to each other. Jesus said the very same thing in Mark chapter 3, verses 31 and 35. He says, uh, as he was teaching, And his mothers and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at, the, at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And so it's key to understand that that doesn't remove you. What Jesus is not trying to do, he's not trying to remove you from your biological connections and network of family. For many of you, you have a, a robust and great family to be a part of. But he's letting us understand that family in the sense of Scripture is not talking about what you're born into, but what you're reborn into. When you become a follower of Jesus and you, are, uh, you pass from death to life, from old to new, one of the new things is that you're a part of a, the family of God. And so what we have here is a collection of brothers and sisters. We're not at our full uh, force right now due to COVID-19 and other things going on, but we are, as members of this body, we are members of the same family of God. And so all families have legacies that they pass on. Some legacies uh, are great and to be celebrated, and some may be a little more embarrassing, but every family has a set of legacies that they pass off. A family legacy is simply uh, a belief or values or attitudes that are passed passed down from generation to generation through the messages that the children receive from their parents. And so 
you, you, like I said, you probably have a, a family legacy that you are. I know uh, I, I love when I talk and meet people uh, in pastor circles that, you know, they're the, they're the fifth or sixth pastor in their family uh, legacy, that their, their father and their grandfather, and they've got uncles and all sorts of people who are in that. Uh, we know that legacies such as military service are big in the city of Jacksonville. You're not, most of you, if you're in the military, you're not the first person in your family maybe in the military that, that you had those in your family go before you. Uh, um, in our you know, day and age and election, we talk about uh, immigration and co- becoming a citizen. And so a legacy of a family is just uh, being hard workers and coming maybe from a, a, co- a different country, uh, becoming an American, working hard to provide for their family. These are the type of legacies that we love to pass on. Uh, maybe you uh, have a legacy like my family, uh, a little crazy, uh, a little unwound sometimes, uh, but those are all great legacies that we, that we pass on. I think about really for my family legacy, I was trying to think about what a legacy would be that I picked up from both my mom's side and my dad's side would just be a strong work ethic. Um, we, we have uh, strong workers in our family and have for a long time. And so I appreciate that. And in times in which I'm feeling lazy or I'm feeling sad about myself or a uh, pity party, I'm reminded that I come from a long line of hard workers and uh, get back up again. It's time to go to work. And so these things are true. And it's not just true for the biological family. It's true for the spiritual family. The Great Commission says, all authority of heaven and earth uh, has been given to me. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you to the very end of the age. This is legacy, family legacy type language in which Jesus has come from the Father, passed on to his brothers and sisters the truth of who God is, and they spread this news, this gospel to other people. Some believe and they get baptized, identify now as a follower of Jesus Christ, and they're taught to obey all that Jesus Christ has uh, has commanded. And this just goes on rinse and repeat that the next generation of believers will rise up and they will preach the gospel to the next generation of believers and they will rise up to preach the gospel to the next generation of believers and so on and so forth. And so the family legacy of the spiritual family is that we make disciples. And today we're going to look at two family legacies in particular found in our scripture passages. The first is a legacy of brotherly love and the second is a work ethic. The first is brotherly love and the second is a work ethic. And so don't shy away. As a preacher, sometimes I'm, I shy away from teaching what the Bible teaches for us to do because we want to make sure that we are clear about the gospel. It is received by faith. We are saved by faith through God's works. That means that you can't do anything to earn God's favor, your salvation. You can't deserve it. You can't earn it. Any of those things that someone would teach you is contrary to the word of God. But then sometimes what we do is by preaching a gospel of grace and faith uh, alone uh, is that we somehow disconnect the commands of God. So if you remember last week, I talked about that we cannot separate the love of God in the gospel from the love of God in his commands. And so by being a follower of Christ, this might be the first time you've ever heard this, and I, and I would hate this to be true. God expects you and I He commands you and I to live a certain way, which means there are things that we are free to do as much as we would like, but then there are also ways of living that we are called and prohibited not to be involved with. And so we live in a day and age in which uh, we are free to do whatever we want to do with no one interceding, not the government, not parents, not the city, and certainly not God. And that is contrary to the what the Word of God teaches. And so as we foster a family of God here, we have to understand that we don't just get the benefits of following Jesus Christ, we also get the responsibilities. And we have a responsibility to be to show brotherly love to each other and to have a strong work ethic. And so let's look at what... Um, Well, I spent the time writing this main idea, so I might as well say it. So it's going to be on the screen. Uh, As members of the family of God, we are called to grow in our love for the church and to be content in our work. All right? So this is where the sermon is heading this morning. And so the first thing we see here is that we have a family legacy of love. Listen to what verses 9 and 10 say for us. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. 
For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And so we see here that he's writing on the topic of brotherly love. This might be something that Timothy brings back to him, that there's some questions, or they have sent it via Timothy, that they have some questions, but they're interested in brotherly love. And and Paul just simply says, I don't need to write to you about this because you are doing this in a great way, not just for the church in Thessalonica, but for the surrounding region. And the only thing he encourages them that they would do this more and more. This word brotherly love is different from the word that we talk about mostly, and that's agape. Agape is a Greek word for love for the unworthy. It's the love that God has for us. We are unworthy of his love, and yet he still loves us. Brotherly love, though, is different. Brotherly love is the is the love, it's a special kind of love that exists between households. And so brothers and sisters love each other in a way uh, that's very different. Um, in my family, we see this as uh, we might disagree in our family, but we do not include anyone outside the family into that disagreement. If someone from outside the family comes to disagree uh, towards us, then there is a unified front uh, in dealing with that. And so uh, that's that's a, a sense of, of how the Hearns get down with brotherly love. Um, if anyone ever called and needed something, there would be no hesitant in my family to go and to be there with them, to help them uh, no matter what. And so you, you guys know what it's like to be in a family maybe of brotherly love or brotherly and sisterly love. Um, it's in the household uh, of faith that we get to see that. Outside the Bible, though, This is in a love that exists. This is not something that is just for believers to experience. It's actually for for children of the same father. It's a love that unites them under a name. And so that's incredibly important. You think back to some biblical stories like Joseph, uh, his brothers, you know, they, they weren't very brotherly loving towards him. But later in this story, we see how they did come to defend him, that some in there struggled with the decisions that they made. Not because Joseph was a great person in their mind, but because he was family. And families take up for each other. And so Paul says about brotherly love that that they're already doing it. The only thing he would ask is that they do it more and more. But he says something really interesting in there that he has no need to write to them because they're already doing this. Which points us to an idea that Jesus talked about in John chapter 14 verses 26. And it says this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so basically what Paul is saying to this early church is that he doesn't have to write to them because they already have the Holy Spirit, which is evident by the way that they love each other. Do you realize that that, that when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit was given to you as a deposit that is teaching you in your heart and in your mind how to follow God's commands. When we sin, He brings conviction. When we're fearful, He brings us courage and faith. When we're despaired and distressed and all anxiety and, and stress and things like that, it's the Holy Spirit that reminds us of the truths of the what the Bible teaches. When we're worried about our future, the Holy Spirit brings about a, a remembrance that Jesus Christ will return and He will care for all of His people. When we're frustrated about justice in our life and in our world, we know that one day the judge will return and He will make everything right. That nothing that goes on in this world that we may seem that falls on deaf ears or blind eyes, that we know that Jesus Christ sees all those things and He will make it right one day. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And evidently, in the life of these early believers, they were already loving each other like a family, which means they were caring for each other. When someone had a need, they were taking care of each other. Uh, all of all of what's included in that. Not just for themselves, but for all of the brothers and sisters in Macedonia, which means this little young church wasn't consumed with the loving each other. That love overflowed its uh, boundaries into other churches. And that's why I'm encouraged when we have a, a, an opportunity to partner with Still City Church, that we're not just loving brotherly love and sisterly love in our church, but we want to encourage and support and pray for uh, and financially bless another congregation in Pittsburgh that it might spring up. 
But there are going to be some opportunities coming up in the next few months for us to do some of this stuff, this sort of brotherly love in our own city. And, and this is just what we see here is this is part and parcel of what it means to be a church. That we, as the people of God, are following Jesus and how we love each other. And um, again, as he has said several times in this chapter, what we are doing is continual action, not a one-time thing. All right, in my own personal life, sometimes I'll think, you've, I know you, some of you probably thought this way, you know, I probably shouldn't do this or think this, I ought to love that person or be kind to them. And then I'll go forth and I'll be compassionate or merciful or whatever, it, whatever the opportunity presents itself. And then I'll be like, all right, I did that. I don't have to do that again for another month. Uh, it's like, you know, you check the box off of whatever God's calling you to do. And we kind of are, we satisfied about that, like we've done something great. But Paul continues to push the envelope. He's like, don't, don't be satisfied. Don't be complacent in loving each other. Figure out how to do this more and more. Which is like, are you kidding me? You mean I, you mean I still got to love that person? I still got to help them when they're in need? I still got to be kind and, and sweet and compassionate, hospitable, all the things that we're called to be towards other people? Exactly. Like we, as a church, we will never arrive at a place where we're doing everything that God has called us to do completely. You won't be that way ever as a father or a mother. You won't ever be that way as a husband or a wife. As a child, you'll not com be completely and perfectly obedient. And so Paul's not saying do this more and more so that God will let you in heaven. The evidence that you have a place in heaven is that you will do this more and more. That's always the thrust of Scripture in that. I wonder if you, looking at the inventory of your life, are you brotherly and sisterly, the family love that's being talked about right now? Is it evident in your life? And I'm not talking about your biological family, okay? You're supposed to love them. I'm talking about your spiritual family. Are you loving towards your spiritual family? That's why it's so important to be a member of a church so that when questions like this that Scripture asks of us continuously, that we can examine not how we're doing generally in the world with other Christians, but we can look back to specific relationships. Do I specifically love the people of Brookwood in a brotherly sense, which means I may not always agree with them, but I'm there to help them. If they ever needed anything, I would be there for them and they would be there for me. That's the kind of love that should dominate, that should be pervading in what a prevalent, that word, uh, in, in the church uh, in a sense that it's, it's growing, it's abounding, it's, it's evident for everyone to see. And so it's a family legacy of love towards each other. And I would say that I do think this church does a really good job. We, we do a good job uh, of brotherly love, but we all have room for, to grow, don't we? I mean, we've, we've been through a lot, at least in, in my time here. We've been through a lot together, and I still get a sense that we love each other and that we will continue to love each other. But as God continues to grow our family, not just numerically, but you know, in other ways, that we have to be always welcoming in new believers, always welcoming in people who might frustrate us or, or vote differently than we do or act differently than we do, that we're loving towards them. The one thing that, that is central to our relationship with each other is that we are following Christ. And if that's the case, then we can love each other. The second thing we see here is a family legacy of work. Verse 11 and 12 says, And to aspire to live quietly to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So apparently there was a misunderstanding in the early church about Jesus' return, which if you've been reading First Thessalonians, you know that's a common theme in, in this book, is his return. In fact, you know, as a kind of promotional thing. The next two weeks, we're going to be dealing with what the return of Jesus looks like. And so y'all bring all your uh, fun and excitement because nothing gets Christians more excited about talking about what it's going to look like when Jesus comes back. And so uh, we're going to tackle that the next two weeks. But there was some misunderstanding in the, in the point that it calls some to stop working. If I told you that Jesus was going to return uh, in three months, you, you may stop Quit your job. 
You know, you may stop paying your house payment because what does it matter if you finish up on your house payment, all right? Uh, you might stop cutting your grass because you're tired of cutting your grass. It's all going to go over. You may not even vote Tuesday. Like if we knew that Jesus was coming three months from now, we would probably do a whole lot less stuff. I'd probably grow my mustache out and wouldn't worry about y'all or what my wife would say. Uh, you know, there's just all kinds of things that you and I would do and get involved with if we thought Jesus was coming around in about three months. But we don't know when he's coming back. And so for some of these Christians, they had stopped working. They'd just been like, hey, Jesus is going to be back any moment now. Why should I go into the field? Why should I you know, continue my trade? Why should I get on a boat and go fishing? Because Jesus is going to come back any moment now. And so it was a misunderstanding that caused them to stop working in the first place. And Paul says, above all things you need to understand, Paul is saying, remember how we did when we were with you the first time. We've instructed you on this. Not only did we teach you these things, but we've modeled them for you. He says to aspire to live quietly. And so that the Greek in there is, is an oxymoron. Uh, it literally says, make it your ambition to have no ambition or to seek restlessly to be still. And so what he's saying is in, your, in our work to keep your mouth shut, mind your own business and get your hands dirty with the work around you. He, he's calling them to model a work ethic that is not only good for the surrounding community, but it's also good for the church itself. Some were, reluct, some were uh, reluctant to work, and they just lived off the charity of other people. All right, now this is really frustrating in when we talk about politics, that, that folks who, um, who don't work benefit so much from the system, and we wish that that was not the case. And, I, and again, I'm not talking about people who are unable to work. I'm talking about people who are unwilling to work. There is a very big difference uh, in this conversation about that. But you know it's frustrating when we have limited amount of resources and we feel like it gets spent in the government on poor, you know, poor reasons or, or reasons that are not needed. Um, and so uh, it, it, is, it is what it is. But that, that's embarrassing. It ought to be embarrassing for those that are able to work that choose not to work because they think that, you know, Jesus is going to be back here uh, soon and everything will be okay. Or I got these lovely couple that will pay my bills and so why should I have to work um, in that? And it's a real thing uh, that we deal with. But if whether it's a society or a church, eventually this kind of idea will kill the church or the society's ability to care for very real needs. If everyone is poor and needy, then, then we will not be able to take care of the, the real poor and needy because we will have spread our resources beyond uh, being any real help. That's true in government. That's also true in the church. We don't have a blank check every week that we can write to pay all of our bills and do all that we want to. We live on, on a budget. We voted on that budget a couple months ago, and we're going to do our best to live by that budget. And so there are limited resources in that budget, and if everybody needs some of that budget, then no one's really going to benefit from the resources that we have. And it doesn't have to be just about money. It could be about, you know, child care. All right. It could be watching children. It could be serving in a ministry. It could be doing a lot of things that are out there. It's those who are unwilling to work, not those who are unable to work. But when we aspire, as Paul says, to live a quiet life, to mind your own affairs and to work with your own hands, then it reinforces the first legacy. The ability for us to grow in our brotherly love for each other is all of us who are able to work doing so in a way in which we can care for those who are in need. Because we never really know when it's going to be our turn. When an accident at work or a health diagnosis or some tragedy is going to strike and you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. And you're going to depend on those who hopefully you've been spending your life taking care of. That, that's how all of this is interwoven together. A church has got to be filled with people who are working hard to care for those that need it. But if everybody needs it, then it's not going to be able to do what it needs to do when the moment arises. And this is a Christian work ethic. The Greeks 
frowned on working with your hands. They felt like that was that was labor, slave labor type work. Nobody wanted in this society wanted to work with their hands. And Paul was saying, no, the Christian church, the kingdom of God that is bursting forth into this world has a long history of strong work ethic. You see, work was introduced into the world before sin. Work is not a result of the fall. God gave Adam and Eve jobs to do for His glory before they sinned. Now, after they sinned, the work got tougher and they didn't produce as much. But sometimes when we think about work, I know that there's a a generation in here that has an incredible strong work ethic, but we're a church of of all sorts of people. So I'm making deposits in young people's lives right now as much as I am talking to 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. if, If we don't develop a strong work ethic, we'll never be able to do what God wants us to do. I remember coming out of college and just shocked at how little I made, all right? How how much I had to work uh, to to get things that, uh, to get to a place in which it was normal to expect a bigger paycheck or some benefits or those type of things. When me and Katie got married, we lived in a house that I, I think it was like 800, 900 square feet. I mean, it was it was something. We could stay, we could get on the other ends of the of the house and, and know what each other was thinking. That's how that's how tight it felt. Um, and and that's a good thing. All right, that's a good thing. You start out in that. We don't live that way now. She's got some places she can hide from me. Uh, but but again, that that's a good good thing to work your way up through that. Work has a way of growing us, does it not? Getting up early in the morning and and putting in a hard day's labor and getting home and being tired, that's a good thing for us. It produces a dependency on God. It produces an appreciation for the gifts that He's given us. It, it, It motivates us to work harder, to develop new skills, and all of that benefits each other. When we have a need, someone can come and help with that. You can't have that if nobody's working. If we're all staying at home waiting on something or waiting on someone else, then we're not going to be any good to each other. And and that's what Paul is saying here. And there's two reasons why we want to have a strong work ethic. The first is that we would walk properly towards outsiders. So we're always living in a glass house. As the people of God, the world is always watching us. And so when we have a strong work ethic, it commands respect. The Southern Baptist, when a disaster strikes, that is when we are our best. When we send men and women to disaster areas to do meals and to clean up disasters and those sorts of things, that's when the world shuts up about not liking Christians and what they have to offer because the work ethic that is present in the kingdom of God is so good for the world. And so it has that same effect. When we are a church made up of people who are working hard and able to help others, it commands respect from the world. A work ethic can do that when sometimes other things can't. The secondly, though, is that none of us would depend on anyone else, that we would not be dependent on anyone. So here's the thing. Paul doesn't want us all being lazy, living off the charity of other people. He wants us being self-sufficient, a sense of personal pride, a sense of uh, integrity, a sense of ambition so that we're caring for ourselves. And if we have a wife or a husband, we're caring for them. And if we have children, we're caring for them. And if we have older parents, we're caring for them. So that none of that taxes the system of the church so that the church is free to care for those who are unable to care for themselves. Not for the rest of their lives, but for a season. That's why I love Philippians Place. They give a hand up, not a hand out, and they're able to spread that, those resources um, across many different families If they were only focused on one family that just refused to work or refused to get help or refused to to get themselves up off the ground and get engaged again, then they would only be able to help one or two families for the whole year. But they're able to to do that because they're spreading that. And and that's what Paul is arguing for. This is what the kingdom of God uh, forces on us. And so why does this matter that, that we might love each other and that we might have a strong work ethic. And how could this make an impact in our community? 
this this week uh, I, I was able to finally sit down and watch a, a documentary. It's on Amazon Prime, and I would really encourage uh, all of you to watch that. It's I mean it's not suitable for the children. There's some language and uh, interviews and, and images that are a little tough, uh, but it looks it's a it's a documentary by Shelby Steele and his son uh, looking at uh, what killed Michael Brown. And so Michael Brown was a teenager who was shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And so Shelby Steele, who's an African-American, uh, done some great work on that. Ask a question, what killed him? Looking at a, a myriad of uh, different things going on in society at that time and really asked some really good questions. And so I was able to sit down and look at that. And so you know, uh, I've said this several times from the stage, a little surprised that I hadn't got any blowback yet. I'm, I am anti uh, social justice uh, and woke, uh, you know, woke lifestyle right now. I think the church right now and its desire to do a good thing is doing a terrible thing, but that doesn't mean that we are not genuinely compassionate for uh, persons and people of color who are struggling, who really are suffering specific instances of racism and oppression. I just don't believe that it's systemic. And so, uh, but as a church, you can be in both places at the same time. You can resist what the culture is trying to ram down your throat and still do what God's calling us to do. And so it's a good documentary to help you understand, especially predominantly in here, we are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of white people in here, uh, to get a perspective on their, uh, on situations in our country that we just don't have. And I think he does a great job at exploring some of those things. And so he looks at uh, what killed Michael Brown and in the instance that I want to highlight is how after Michael Brown uh, and government got involved in that and the aftermath, there were a lot of riots in Ferguson and protests, and they were all over the country. This really kicked off again uh, Black Lives Matter, which again, of course, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter as an organization is dangerous and demonic and seeks to, to take from people what they are given by their creator. And so the church can care for people of color without affirming and encouraging and supporting organizations that seek to destroy people at their very core. And so he examines how this played out in the world, and he looked at how a one particular church engaged in what was going on. And so he's looking at the difference between poetic truth versus objective truth and how these always butt heads and how one seems to get people spun up towards ideas that are going on in the world. But objective truth is trying to have facts and answer specifically what's actually going on and how you can do and affect positive change. And so in the documentary, it highlights the work of uh, Corey Brooks. Corey Brooks is uh, the founding pastor of New Beginnings Church in Southside Chicago. Does a great ministry there. And so one of the things that he did as he he desired, uh, this is an African-American man, moving into a, a, an area that is predominantly African-American in Southside Chicago, and he's seeking to help the, the least of these in our community, those living in government housing, suffering from crime and drugs and, and all sorts of things going on there. And he does a better example of, of talking about how all those uh, situations uh, spring up and how they are continued to be led along. But, and specifically, how he goes about his ministry, I think, paints a perfect picture for how what Paul is calling the Thessalonians to do, and by extension, us to do, uh, impacts. And, and this is an exact uh, quote from uh, a young man who uh, is describing the first time he met Pastor, Pastor Brooks. And again, I'm quoting word for word. I'm not trying uh, to, be, to be funny. He says, I'm going to be honest. I just did 11 years for the feds. I got some good street skills. My friends take me to church. And I'm like, who am I meeting? And they're like, you're going to meet the pastor. And I'm like, I don't want to meet the pastor. I just came home. They're like, no, you have to go talk to him because he runs our neighborhood now. And I'm like, he don't run no neighborhood I'm in. So we seen the pastor, and he was like, okay, I know who you are. I heard a lot about you. Glad to see you're home, but I'm the new sheriff in town. Do you really know what you did to your community? I'm like, no, what? He said, you tore your community down. And so this young man goes on to become a Christian and works side by side, Pastor Corey Brooks, in the ministry that he offers now. 
And I love stories like that when uh, a man or a woman or a community or a church takes responsibility for the area that they live in and seeks to plant themselves there to see God do a great thing. And you're talking about this story uh, in which there are those that are gatekeepers for everything in that community and for a pastor to set himself up as a gatekeeper against those who have uh, run that area. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of potential for a lot of disaster in that. But but here's what I love uh, that Shelby Still ends his documentary with. He says, I wonder what have happened to Michael Brown if he had the opportunity to run into Pastor Brooks. That pastor and that church preaches the gospel. Not only do they preach the gospel, but they teach those families and those individuals and those children and those people that live in that community, they teach them the ethics of the kingdom of God, of how hard work is something not to shy away from, but to get developed in and to get involved in. And you see uh, men and women, young people, older people finding uh, new trades and developing new trades and able to sustain themselves and sustain their families. And, And it's not just about what you can do in that environment to make yourself better, Because this young man who was now taking advantage and making a lot of money off of his community for drugs is now leading other young people to know the Lord and to develop a work ethic and to take care of each other. In this documentary, you see um, there was this phrase that where this community was absent of any real fathers, now everybody calls Pastor Brooks their daddy because this man loves them and he tells them hard things and he teaches them things that they can do. And again, this is not, we're making, this is not a church trying to make better citizens out of its people. This is a church trying to make disciples. And part of being a disciple is caring for each other, your brothers and your sisters, and having a good, strong work ethic so that your resources can sustain you and what's left over can help sustain other people who have needs from time to time. And so we do the, we have the same opportunity that's lying right in front of us. Our world is absent of good fathers and mothers who need someone to come alongside and to, to share with them, first and foremost, the good news of Jesus Christ, but then to teach them life skills, to teach them what it means to be a godly man and a godly woman, to be a godly husband and a godly father about learning how to work. And so many of you are so talented if you would give yourself to this sort of ministry that you're surrounded day in and day out for people who need someone who's a little bit farther down in their walk with the Lord to care about them. I, I think it's that there's a big temptation to get so hot and bothered, so mad about the world not sharing our values, but we don't do anything about it. If we want to really make an impact for the kingdom of God in the city of Jacksonville and around, then we will share Christ. We will mentor people. We will get into the messiness of life and to help them or her become a better person. Not a better person in a sense of just in the world, but a better person in Christ, just like someone did for us. When we follow the ethics of the kingdom, More and more, there's no limit to what God might do in our midst. So I ask you the question, are are you loving? Maybe think about this this week. Is there anyone that God is calling you to be this sort of Christian for? Maybe someone who's already a believer, but think beyond that. Maybe it's someone who doesn't know Jesus. Probably someone that maybe gets on your nerves or is very different than you. To go and to have a ministry that will make an eternal impact. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, as we, as we end this sermon and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, God, I pray that, that you would teach us right now, Father, that your Spirit, who's already been at work in our hearts, would help us to understand how this, this love for each other and this legacy of work flows from a relationship with Jesus Christ. God, I pray for those in our midst that don't know you as the Messiah, the Lord and our Savior. God, I pray that 
that they would examine what we say about him, what he is, has done for us and what he is able to do, that he lived a perfect life, never doing anything wrong according to God's word, and that he intentionally went to a cross, not for his sins, but for our sins, that he was murdered and buried. But three days later, God raised him from the grave to show as evidence that everything he said about himself was true and that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. God, if we knew now all that it would have cost us when we decided to follow Jesus, it might have intimidated us. It might have scared us off. But thankfully, because we know Jesus more and more from that first day to now, we wouldn't trade it all. We wouldn't trade any of it. We wouldn't keep back any of it, God. We would continue to follow you. And so I pray for those who don't know you, God, to, to know you. I pray for all of us, God, to examine our hearts and how we are living as a family of God, how we're working as a family of God, that, that we would be free from living off other people and free to live our lives so that we take care of ourselves and are able to take care of others. And God, that this story about how the gospel is making an impact in the south side of Chicago might, might encourage our hearts to do the same. God, you know the plans that you have for us. You know the people who are in need. Give us eyes to see. Encourage to move forward in faith. God, we also now prepare to come to a table. A table that represents for us what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf and the hope that we have in his finished work. God, we pray for during this time, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts as we worship you in the Lord's Supper, that we would prepare our hearts to take it in confession. God, that we would take this Lord's Supper together as a church and that we would be encouraged and reminded of your sacrifice and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.